Oh, uh, well, uh, one thing for sure, you can never tell about Missouri weather. We may have another one of those in there next week or two. Okay, today I'm going to be preaching out of the third chapter of the book of James. James. You, could, you can get in there and find it and turn to that third chapter. Now, I uh, was thinking, driving around one day, working in the, on the farm, and I was thinking about this sermon and what I was going to, what we were going to say and how I'd say it. And it just dawned on me, this just flashed in my mind, a good title for this message. So I just called it the, A Weapon of Mass Destruction. <laughs> All right, now when we get into this sermon, you're going to see what I'm talking about. Because you have on your body uh, a weapon of mass destruction. And, you know, if you're going to carry a weapon, you have to have a license for it. But you don't have to have a license for this one. And it's much more dangerous than a pistol or a, a gun. And everybody's got one. Well, most people have one. And we carry it around with us all the time. You remember when uh, George W. was in uh, the presidency and we invaded Iraq because we thought they had weapons of mass destruction. And so they hit them or got rid of them or didn't have them or something. But uh, and they, we kind of got fooled by that. But the interesting thing is uh, we've got a thing in, in, in our mouth. We call it the tongue. <laughs> And we carry it around all the time, and it can kill people, not just one at a time, but it can kill a lot of people at one time. You say, what are you talking about? Well, what if uh, Adolf Hitler had not have said some of the things he said? Millions of people died because of his words. See, th this thing uh, that we carry around with us is dangerous, mm -hmm. and we have to be aware of it because it's a weapon of mass destruction. Now, this, as this, I kind of got ahead of myself and told you, but... This weapon is our words, our communication, our language, uh, or as James just summarizes it, calls it the tongue. Now, the tongue is a little muscle that sits in your mouth, and, and it's uh, most people's tongue is connected to their brain. Most. Right? <laughs> Not everybody's is connected. But most people's have, have, have a connection that goes to their brain and it helps it say what it wants to say, and then sometimes it tries to keep it from saying things it shouldn't say. And so either way today, we, we've got this thing called a tongue, and we've got to learn how to control it, because if we don't, man, it can destroy our lives, it can destroy our family, it can destroy our, our community, it can destroy, I mean, it's worse than a, top, than a bomb going off somewhere. Now the psalmist was thinking about this, uh, when he thought about his communication, and he wrote uh, a psalm, that I, and he said these words, Set a guard over my mouth. O oh Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. And what a, a song we ought to sing every morning when we get up. Lord, set a guard over my the door of my mouth. And, and keep watch over the door of my lips. That would be great for us to, to learn to do that. Now, we are today going to be dealing with that the horrible thing called the tongue. But remember, it can do, do good. And it can do bad. It can go either way. Uh, <clears throat> have you ever heard him say, loose lips sink ships? Well, that's, we've all heard that. Well, in, in first century Palestine, there was a lot going on politically and religiously and economically. They were in a drought and it was a mess. You wouldn't want, wouldn't want, not want to have lived in first century Palestine. It was not been a good, good place. And to add to that, there... There was this class of Jewish people, the elite, the rich, the uh, erudite, those people, and they were oppressing the poor. The rich people, the rich Jews, were making it worse on the poor Jews than it had to be. They were uh, really mean to them. They had everything they wanted, and there were people around them starving to death, and they were still taking them to court, suing them, you know, not paying on their wages. They were mistreating the population terribly. So James, who is the pretty much the pastor of the church, there it, it was the first cowboy church of Jerusalem, right? Well, okay. <laughs> James was the pastor of that church, and uh, he was trying to lead them, and, and he got on this subject in this in his letter that he wrote, and he started talking about the tongue, and so James wants us to know we need to learn how to manage our tongues. We need to know how to control them. How to make them say good things and keep them from saying bad things. Does anybody in here have trouble like that with me, besides me? All this, sometimes it just takes off and disconnects from the, the brain and when just goes and does its own thing. And we hate that when it does. <clears throat> 
The, the question I want to try to answer this morning from the text is, how do Christians control their tongue? What do we do? Do we? What strategies do we learn? Do we? we what do we do? Well, James just lays out several ideas here for us and ways for us to help control our tongue. So today I want you to, to, to learn with me from the book of James chapter 3 and let's see if we can figure out how to put our bridle on this thing, how to control it, how to make it more under control. Well, James starts out and he just simplifies what he's going to say by simply saying, don't say any more than you have to. Say as little as you possibly can. That's the first thing he's going to say. Just don't say much. It's kind of like riding around in the car with my brother, Lonnie. I don't know if you know my brother, Lonnie. But uh, we'll ride around together, or, you know, farm together, whatever. And we may say four, five, six words all day long to each other. You know, we just don't talk. My wife and I don't talk either much. When we're traveling, we just enjoy the quiet. We get in there, and, and uh, when somebody gets in there and talks, we go look at each other like, well, how can they learn to say that much? You know, what, what are they going to talk about? And I've got a grandson. I don't want to call him out or anything like that. But I'll say, Jack, how you doing? Fine. What's been doing? Nothing. That's it. We're done. For the day. Love you, Jack. <clears throat> He's more than that, but I have to tease him about his quietness, and I honor that sometimes. But we need to learn to just not say as much as we do. We talk too much. Am I by myself? We just talk. We really say too much. Okay, because you just can't control everything you say. So. Just stop saying so much. Okay, you say, where do you get that? Well, let's just read and see what James says. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. <coughs> James just says, if you can control your tongue, you're perfect. And if you can get that, you've done it all. Now, teachers are judged by a higher standard than most. For instance, people who preach, <coughs> teachers, high school, college, grade school teachers, politicians, people who live by their tongue, uh, they're in more danger than, than everybody else. Because we live and we use this most dangerous weapon all the time. So uh, we have to be careful with it. We're judged by a higher standard. Do you know why teachers and politicians and leaders are judged? Because they have more potential to take their words and do good things or do bad things because of their position. They have a lot more potential to tear up. And so we have to, they're judged more carefully. And by the way, we need to pray for our leaders, for people who, who speak and who, who teach because we, we, they need all the help they can get and we need to help bless them. <clears throat> now your career, if your career involves speaking or teaching, uh, you can say things you don't need to. Anybody ever misspoke? You've been telling a story or said something to somebody, and just out of nowhere something will come out, and, and you don't know where it came from or what, whatever. It's we misspeak often, and, and we get in trouble. America is pretty much tired of politicians or preachers or anybody who say one thing to one group and then something else to somebody else. We we need people who stand up. For, for right, for liberty, for freedom. And we need people in our country to say what they mean and to, and to mean what they say. And uh, I, I think it's important that we learn to do that. So today, we're going to work on, we're going to talk about working on our tongue. This guy I'm going to tell you about now, he had a lot of trouble. He was new on a job. Uh, he was an air, air, uh, air traffic controller, first day on the job. And he got in there and he was... He was he just got the microphone and he was looking at his screen and he saw planes coming. He's, he looked off into the west and he saw a plane coming in. And he said, and they've radioed in and said, we'd like to land. And he said, well, come on in, Boeing 747. Gave the number. Said, you're cleared to run. You're on a short final on that on that west runway. Said, come right on in. And just about the time he got through saying that, the a plane cl clapped, his microphone clapped, clapped over here. He said, wait a minute. He said, you just cleared us to land on the east runway. And uh, so he stood back for just a moment, got real quiet in the control room. Then pretty soon he came to the mic and he said, y'all be careful out there, you hear? <laughs> <laughs> that was a time for caution. Wasn't it? <clears throat> we get in trouble doing that all the time. Yeah. Language is dangerous stuff. Uh, I, I love the t-shirt that I see once in a while firemen are, uh, will wear it if they're on bomb squads especially. It says, it says, if you see me running, you take out after me. You know, so, but we, our language, we've got to use that carefully, describe us carefully. 
Now we need to know that uh, your tongue, you need, James wants us to know that our tongue is a little thing. It's not very big. But it is, it can maneuver and handle and, or drive huge things. It's little, but it controls big things. Let's keep reading with James here. He says, take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great for forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Now, listen to me very carefully. I want you to know this. Dynamite comes in small packages, right? If you, have you ever met my mama? About five foot tall. 87, but she acts like she's 27 or 57. Younger, but... But she, I want to tell you, dynamite comes in small packages. That woman can, can cause some explosions if you don't get stuff right around her. <clears throat> now James says that that's, that's just what happens. Our tongue is like a little thing, like a ship's rudder or a, a campfire in a dry forest. It can set on things, set on fire huge things and cause great damage, even though it's small. It's a world of evil. Now get this. Now, now James, he just comes right out and says, our tongues are a world of evil. They are potentially deadly and devastating. So he warns us to watch our tongue and to guard it. Now in a moment in the sermon, we're going to talk about what controls our tongue, where the information comes from for our speaking. And, and but, but James just says right here, our tongues originate in hell. Our language, if we don't watch it, but for instance, if you just turned your tongue loose and let it say whatever it wanted to say, it would almost always come from hell itself. You think, well, now wait a minute, preacher, I'm not sure that's true. Well, just mash your thumb with a hammer. <laughs> and before you have time to think, do you say, oh, I love Jesus so much? <laughs> do, you, do you say it like that? No, you might say Jesus. Or, uh, you wouldn't be bragging on him or something. Would be. So that's what I'm saying. When you got time to think, when you can control it, it, then it, it, you can make it speak heaven's words. But if you just let it talk on its own, it gets its source of from information from someplace else. So we have to be careful because it can, and just, you know, when we, we know each other by what we say to each other. We know so much about us because our tongue uh, tells you what our hearts are thinking. Our tongues will say what's down inside us. We don't have to worry about it. What's on somebody's mind? Just be around them a little while. They'll tell you. I mean, it just pops out. So never underestimate the power of what you say. Watch it. Guard it carefully. It's small, but it is so dangerous. I think today, if anything else, if I can just make you aware to once again think about what you say and be, be more heavenly minded as you say it. Now, James goes on, and he's going to bring some more illustrations into his teaching here. And he says, never be fooled into thinking your tongue is in control. Never be fooled. Because you may think you've got it in control, but you can't relax. You can never just turn it loose. Let's see what he says. Verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can ever tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poisons. James, he's kind of discouraged about the tongue. He says, you can't control it. You can't fix it. You just, I mean, it's just on its own. It's restless, he says. It's always looking around. Have you ever had something you wanted to say? And, and I mean, you just couldn't stop it. I mean, you just had to say it. It jumps out of your mouth. There have been times I thought, I don't want to tell that anybody that. I want to keep that to myself. And boy, before long, I'm just blabbing it. You know, because our tongue is... We can't control it. I'll tell myself, shut up. You don't, don't say that. But I'll find myself in a minute saying it. And, and boy, our tongue, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's restless. It wants to say something. Uh, and it's full, James says, it's full of deadly poison. <clears throat> I've got an old 15-year-old uh, fox-trotting horse that's uh, a family pet, sort of. He, everybody rides him. He's gentle and he's, you know, he's a, a bomb proof. You know, I don't think he'd shy if a pig rode by on a motorcycle. You know, I think he's, he's pretty calm, old horse, and pretty easy going. And 
and uh, everybody rides him and we love him and one day my, my grandson, I'm talking about Jack a lot this one day my grandson and I were down, down at my mom's house, I don't know what we was doing, he was riding by on Traveler and came by mom's chicken house and out of the chicken house flew a bunch of wasps, red wasps, and stung that horse. And I never saw such a rodeo in all my life <laughs> out of this bomb-proof horse. He bucked. I, I, uh, Jack, we should have had you at Calgary. I mean, you'd have won a big prize up there at, on bucking horse. And he bought my son, grandson just rode him like a pro. But boy, he'd have, I'd still be in the hospital if I'd been on him. So. It was great. So the lesson I've learned is no horse is bomb-proof. Uh, they never get tamed. And uh, no, and the tongue is never tamed. It's always going to fly loose. So we have to guard it and be aware of it. Now, the next thing James tells us about our tongue is that it's, it's completely inconsistent. It's just inconsistent. Let me just read it. Verse 9. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings. I saw a video this past week of a Christian going to church, driving his car, and uh, and his road rage just would fly out, and then he'd come back, and he'd be a real Christian, and then he'd fly out in road rage, and it, you know, it's like it's inconsistent. He'd praise the Lord, and the next minute he'd be swearing at somebody driving by, or whatever. So out of the mouth, verse verse ten, out of the mouth comes praise and cursing, my brothers and sisters. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding of you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitterness, envy, bitter envy, and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from, the, from heaven but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. The tongue is capable of doing something that no, nothing else in nature can do, and that is go in two directions at the same time. It can praise the Lord and curse a brother. It can, in other words, it, it's totally against nature what the tongue can do. It's dangerous. And, and Matthew tells us a little bit more about this in chapter 12 because Matthew says, and he again identifies, the source of what we say comes from our heart. Again, I want to say, when we speak, we reveal our inner man, our inner person. So we have to be careful how we use that. Listen to what it says in Matthew. A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. We speak from what's inside. Okay, so James, he goes straight to the heart of the problem. He says it's not your tongue so much. It's your heart, your double-mindedness. And it sure shows up. In, in this. Now, let me, I've been beating you up all the morning with my tongue, right? Telling you how bad you are, how bad you can. How, well, let me say to you, the good news of the sermon today is God forgives us of all sin. So if you have terribly misused your tongue, you've hurt people's feelings, you've, you've, you've spoken to folks in a way that you wish you hadn't been, you've you know, put people down, you've been bitter or negative, you can be forgiven of that. God will forgive you. You need to go to Him and honestly admit it and then help Him to trust you. Help Him to set you free. A little, little kid uh, went up to their mom and they said, Mommy, how did you know you loved Daddy? Well, she said, I talked to him and got to know him. We spent time together and, and we, you know, we learned to know each other by we talked and, and shared. And, and the little boy said, well, if you ever want a new one, you can go to Match.com and they guarantee you'll like the next one. <laughs> well, kids, right? So, like a modern truck that can run on multiple different kinds of fuels, the tongue can run on different sources. It can be sourced from hell or it can be sourced from heaven. So we need to be very careful about what we let resource our speaking and our language. Now, I'm going to give you, in closing, a test so that you can always test your language. 
James is going to actually share it with us uh, in, in verse 17. But he's going to tell you how your language, how you can look at it, what you say, and you can see if it's coming from hell or if it's coming from heaven. Right? That's what he says. Let's read it. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first full of pure, full of pure, then, first of all, pure, then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial, and, and sincere. Let me go back over the list. I kind of stumbled with my tongue there. Let me go back over the list. First of all, he says, when you say something, if it's pure, if it, in other words, if it, if it comes from good motives, if it comes from a clean heart, if it's spoken out of, in, in love to a loving person, you can know that's coming from God. He says, look at it and see, is it peace loving? Now, sometimes we can take our tongue and start a fight. Come on. <laughs> or we can start love. We can create a good relationship. So if you're starting a fight, it's not coming from heaven. Come on. Yeah. All right. So now the next thing he says is, is your tongue is considerate of everyone. It will consider others. In other words, there's a there's a New Testament Paul tells us Timothy to, to walk circumspectly. What that means is to walk in a circle looking carefully wherever you go so that you won't hurt people or step on them or offend them or in some way put a stumbling block for them. And so with our tongue, we need to be considerate of everyone. You know, there's so many things I could tell you about the tongue that, 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 and the illustrations, but I'm going to limit it to, to simply, we have to be careful that we don't hurt people. We can hurt folks as they eavesdrop over our conversations or... You know how, what I've noticed? You, can, you can't say anything to anybody but what they would find out about it. I don't care. I don't know how it works like that. But people always find out what you've said, good or bad. So I learned a long time ago to try to sow good seeds in people's conversation. And, and when somebody will say, well, do you know so-and-so? And if I know them and I'm honest, I'll, I'll say yes. And then I'll try to think some good attribute about them. I say, boy, he's a, you know, he's a wonderful whatever or a good because I try to sow good thoughts and good seeds because if you don't, I'm, it's going to come back to you. People are going to know this. So consider it others. The next thing is, good language or good speech submits itself to God's influence. That goes without saying. We let God influence. Then it goes on to say, it is merciful. How many of you are strong on mercy? How many of you wish you were stronger on mercy? Yeah. We need to be stronger on it. Mercy comes from heaven. And when we speak, we need to speak mercy. Uh, and it produces good fruit. It's balanced and fair-minded. And then it can be taken seriously. Those are some things. If you ever wonder about your language, go back to James 3 and read 17, verse 17, and let it speak to you again. Now, here's what we do. And then I want to close with verse 18. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. People who speak peace, who speak love, who speak fair mind, who speak, who speak from heaven, that they sow peace and they reap a harvest of righteousness. What are you reaping today? Is your life reaping a, a, a life of righteousness and a harvest of peace? Or is it turmoil and chaos and, and hatred and bitterness? <coughs> Pretty much what we sow is what we reap. Sow good words. Sow good words. Use them. Speak lovingly about people and when we want to start a fight, don't. Amen? Amen. So peace and reap righteousness. Father, we come.